flooded in The ground beneath is watered and worked on all its life But I must make my living taking fish off this dry pile So dry pile Thank you, Rob. I really appreciate that. You know, we didn't get to uh, we didn't get to participate in the uh, in the banquet this year, and we've always enjoyed that. Both yeah. Tom and I, it's been so much fun. So we couldn't resist laying a laying a tune down there for you to start out with. Uh, so I hope you'll uh, indulge us for doing that. <laughs> 
I'm going to uh, turn my uh, turn my camera around, and we're going to get in a little bit more comfortable position here. I managed to get some uh, some leather chairs for the shop, and uh, Tom and Dave's, of course, have been arguing about you know whose whose chair is whose tonight. So. We know whose chair it is. Though. <laughs> the argument can be made, but we know whose chair it is. <laughs> But uh, been kind of enjoying that. But uh, you, you guys didn't come to hear us sing and play. Uh, you came to hear, hear us talk about fishing. So uh, so let's talk about it. Let me get a little bit closer. Can you hear us all right? Somebody give me a thumbs up if you can hear us all right. All right, good. All right, great. So uh, so Tom and I have been fishing pretty hard this year. Yeah, we, Tom. Yeah. Uh, and mostly pan fish. I haven't really hit the rockfish too hard yet. I don't talk too much about my rock fishing trips too early in the year anyway, because um, but I don't know. I just get a lot of people who have recognize me out there and I'm pretty <laughs> protective about my spring fishing spots. Uh, but uh, not that I want to share them, you know, back channel or something, but I don't like putting them on, in public. Uh, but, uh, but we've been doing a whole lot of pan fishing and the shad fishing. Yeah. Uh, has really been good this year and I haven't even been to Fletcher's this year so you guys probably know a whole lot more about Fletcher's than I do um, but let me tell you about some of the streams over this way so you know I live on the eastern shore here on Ken Island uh, and shad has been I wouldn't say it's been off the hook on, on the eastern shore but it's been good red bridges was good there's still shad there now it's not over yet uh, a few not a whole lot um, the uh, uh, Tuckahoe Creek uh, was good, and then uh, the streams on further south were good too. But the real story this year was where, Tom? Tuxent River. The Tuxent River. Uh, and I know a lot of you guys uh, uh, fish the Patuxent or it's in range for you. Uh, and uh, man, it was good. Yeah. Tell, tell them about some of your days, Tom. Yeah, I, I caught uh, 111 shad on one morning and 67 shad. The, the next day and I, I have to give respect uh, a shout out to my friend Matt Gins or Matt Gins who who really hit me to a spot it was no further than a, a quarter mile from my childhood fishing spot I grew up fishing the Patuxent River and I've got some spots and I had showed Matt some spots and then he said hey let me take you to my childhood fishing spot and it was I mean amazing the best shad fishing I've, I've ever had hands down size, quantity and quality. I got Citation American Shad. Oh no, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say that. No, there was a mistake there. I got Citation, <laughs> I thought I had a Citation <laughs> American Shad. Uh, I got Citation Hickory Shad constantly, but we were getting Shad, we were getting Americans nearly 20 inches, maybe a couple over 20. Hickory's well, constantly well over 18 inches. Just And they were just crushing bait. If we weren't catching two at a time, it was disappointing. And it was like that for hours on end. But my two great days, those two days back to back, 170 fish caught in a couple hours. Just unbelievable. You know, Tom and I had a conversation a while back about all the fishing spots that we drive past in order to get to where we think are good fishing spots. Yeah. And, and you know, Tom was just saying this is really close to his house. And there's another spot that is literally yeah. within walking distance from his house yeah. where he's been catching shad all, yeah. um, all, all spring. Uh, in that area. And that's kind of the way it is with panfish. And it, shad's not, you know, not technically a panfish, but uh, we use the same deer. We use some of the same equipment. Uh, and that's kind of the way it is. There's always a place to fish for panfish. And you know, I've, I've unfortunately had two back surgeries within six months at the first part of the, the end of last year and first part of this year. And I wasn't able to do a whole lot of walking at all. Uh, and, uh, but still there was plenty of places that I could get to and fish. Uh, and, you know, we tend to think of panfish as an introductory fish, you know, it's something that the kids do. And you probably, if you're like me, you grew up, you know, your first fish was probably a white perch or maybe yellow perch or bluegill. Uh, and, and mine was too. I don't remember my first fish I ever caught because I was so young, but, uh, but it was. But, you know, the older I get and the more I fish, the more I realize that it's just pure fishing. Yeah. You know, there's just something so satisfying yeah. about going out there and where if it's, you know, I've learned places where you can catch bluegill consistently as big as your hand. 
uh, here in, in Maryland and in and some spots in Virginia. Uh, and, and some of it's just runoff ponds. You know, it's just like there's an industrial park right down the street here. I can walk down there and I can catch green sunfish pretty much all day. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it's just fun fishing. Uh, and, uh, and there's something that the, the point I wanted to make with this talk tonight is that it, that attraction, that draw that brings us to craving that kind of fishing, that one person, one rod, one cast, one lure, well, maybe two lures on the same yeah, right, right. <laughs> It's exactly what we do with light tackle rockfish. Yeah. That's exactly what we do. That's what drew me to it. I bet that's what draws you to it. Uh, those of you who do it, and I see a lot of names that I recognize on the on the call here, and I know there's a lot of really good light tackle fishermen in this call, and. Uh, and a lot of you guys can probably teach me something, but it, there's just something pure about casting uh, for rockfish uh, or for any kind of fish uh, for that matter. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about a couple of techniques that I like. You heard me mention tandem rigs and a tandem rig, all that is, is I probably got one here somewhere. Um, that's a good thing about being in the shop is that we can, uh, can you see those two lures hooked hook to hook there? That's just two busting baits with a uh, one, uh, it's probably a 116. What size are those? Yeah, 16th on the uh, top. That's two sixteenths. Two sixteenths, okay. Yeah. Or you can use two thirty seconds. It pays to experiment a little bit. Look at all the action. Now I might be shaking a little bit, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, it's the fishing rod. Uh, it's not the beer. Uh, but uh, look at all the action in those tails. And that, so it's a real fast frequency uh, lure. We put those about a foot and a half, two feet apart. That's mm -hmm. all. Cast them out. Yep. Killer what, 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 the white busting baits this, this spring for me, I, they couldn't, I was gluing them back together, gluing them on the hooks because they were just ripping them apart. Could not keep them on those tandem rigs. And we fish those soft plastics like that more than we fish shad darts anymore. Yeah, I, I, I did not fish a shad dart the entire shad season. I, there was no need to. That tandem rig is just unbelievable. Put a, a, a 16th on top and a 32nd on the bottom and just popping that thing along, that bottom lure, that 32nd just gets all kinds of action yeah, on it. I'm sure. You know. And so that's a great technique. And then my other go-to technique, and if you've read my book, you, you know there's a whole chapter about it. Uh, and that is just a float and fly. And so, um, well, let's, let's let Tom tell you about it. So I, I, I think I introduced Tom to float and you fly did, you fishing. Did. You did. You taught me um, how to, to float. And I, in turn, taught both of my daughters, and they caught their first fish <laughs> on float and fly. Yeah. So it's just a, a, a 30 second, you can use a 32nd of an ounce trout fly. We love the uh, Popeye flies. Those things, I think you got one right here. Those mm. things are deadly. The, the pink and white, the chartreuse and white, and then take a float and put it depending on the, the the depth that you're fishing, you know, four to seven feet. You you can adjust the float, just get it on the line and adjust up and down the line according to what what depth you think the fish are, and you just kind of pop it along. And it's basically you're basically jigging that that lure in a specific area. So again, very similar to how we do rock when we jig for rockfish, we can put that lure right in front of that fish and then pop it along. And it's, it's irresistible, all species. Yeah. It's irresistible. When you think about it, when you're fishing with a lure under a float, really what you're doing is vertically jigging from a remote location. Uh, so really you're just popping the float along and the lure is moving along in the water at pretty much a set depth because you set the depth, right. as Tom said. Uh, and so it's just another way of vertical jigging. Now, also, if you've read my book, you've heard me brag about these little green cap floats. Uh, they're made by, uh, they, were, they were once made by the Dayton company. That's who invented them. And then uh, Dayton got bought out by Plastilite. And then Plastilite got bought out by Rebel Fin. And Rebel Fin is who makes them now, except they've discontinued them now as well. So they're almost impossible to find. In fact, I just bought two boxes on, on eBay of the original, well, they were the Plastilite version. 
uh, from the 1960s, and I think I paid $56 a piece for a box for a dozen floats. That's expensive <laughs> for floats, but I like them that much. However, yep. there is an option. Oh, and just to give you an idea of how big that that is, here's a. I'm not plugging Shinerbach, although it is pretty good beer. So <laughs> that's uh, it will fit down in a Shinerbach bottle top. See, so it'll it'll go. It'll fit down in there. It's a three quarter inch float. It's tiny. The reason you want a small float is because one for one thing it increases the action of your lure you can you can jerk it a little bit faster that makes that fly underneath there move a little bit faster frequency and at the same time it shows you the strikes a whole lot easier than a uh, you know say a a bigger bobber or a weighted bobber now this is the traditional bobber that we see so much around here the advantage of that bobber is that it's got this lead ring around the bottom right there so you can cast it for a long distance and it's aerodynamic too that is one of the drawbacks for this uh for this technique is you don't really get distance casting with it but you get you makes up for it in action and sensitivity but tom found some floats that work yeah. just as well show, show them that one tom. yeah and this this is sort of like the the revamped version by rebel fin is that correct yeah, by rebel so, fin. so so it doesn't have the green cap uh on it. it's got a black cap and can, can i see the other float yeah. here here I'm going to give you just the, some pros and cons about what I think about it. This is, I mean, that's the one, but if you're anything like me, I, I hang these up in trees like you wouldn't believe. So the ones that Sean have given me are in various fishing spots. Here's the, the, the thing I didn't like about this particular bobber and, it, and it's a small, so it has nothing to do with fishing. The, the, the top part is so hard and the, the metal class goes through the middle of it, it'll hurt your finger just to kind of set it. I think they solved that problem because of the fact that this black top has a bigger top. So functionality wise, it's a lot easier to use, which is nice. Now, I I fished this one all spring and we were sort of A, B and against each other on the, the float and fly thing. And I got used to using this one to the point where I don't miss that other one, partially because I don't have any more of them. So I, <laughs> I can't miss them, but this one is a nice float and it's, it's similar. It's got a little, a slightly different action. I don't think it shows the strikes as cleanly as the other one does, but once you get used to what the strike looks like, I, I felt like I wasn't, I wasn't missing fish at all because of, of, of the float. So I would, if you can find these, I've got two or three boxes of them and they're not going to cost you 50 bucks. That's for sure. Yeah. So, I, so where do we get those? Uh, I can't. Walmart. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. They, I thought it was Walmart, Walmart online. Walmart, yeah. Online, yeah. yeah. Walmart. yeah. Com, and I think they're like maybe six or seven bucks a box. Yeah. I mean, it, they are cheap and they will do the trick. You know, like what he said about the, the size of, of, of the bobber, that's, that's the key. It real do not use a bobber to, that's too big. You want that quarter inch size bobber. And and part of the reason for that is because sometimes panfish strikes are subtle, especially crappy. Uh, I'm, I'm from you know I'm from Tennessee. We say crappy. Some people say crappy. I've heard them call speckle perch. Uh, I've heard them call sockele. Uh, a lot of people call them different names, but they're you know they're the quintessential panfish and the most popular fish in America. Uh, as far as fishing goes, more people fish for crappie than anything else. But uh, most of the time, a crappie will hit a, a, a lure from the bottom. And so they can have it in their mouth and that float will hardly yeah. ever move. Yep. Sometimes it just lays over a little bit. Yeah. You yeah. see a little more yeah. red than you would be yep. uh, otherwise. And that's a crappie strike, so that's a hook. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing, you know, I'd say when, when, when Sean was teaching me that technique, you know, you don't feel the strike that much on float and fly. Rarely do you really feel yeah. you're looking. It's it's all about that strike detection. And that's what that that's when that bobber, that float is so, so important. And I, I recall a trip we did last year during the perch run uh, up in the chop tank and and it gets a little competitive on the boat. <laughs> and he was wearing me out. And I because I was sort of waiting to feel as opposed to just watching. So I watched him a couple of times and I, I went, oh, I got it. And it was every time. And we must have got a couple hundred perch that day. Yeah. I mean, just watching that, detecting that strike and you'll learn that, you know, you'll learn. And as soon as you learn how to detect that strike, you set the hook by just lifting the rod up. It's not a big set, right? No. Just lifting the rod up and man, it's it's amazing. I mean, you're, you're on every time. Yeah. And so that kind of subtlety it's a perfect lead into rockfish mm. uh, because when we're jigging for rockfish, 
any little change matters. One night, I might have told this story before, but it's worth telling again. One time, John Page Williams was sitting right there where you're sitting. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you guys don't know John Page, John Page is retired now, a senior uh, naturalist for the Chesapeake Bay Foundation for many years. Uh, the, uh, the governor bestowed the honor of Admiral of the Chesapeake on him. Uh, <laughs> the single smartest person when it comes to the Chesapeake Bay that I've ever met, and I'm proud to consider him a mentor. Um, but um, the conversation, and I, I will admit that we've been about halfway through a bottle of scotch by the time <laughs> it came up, but, uh, but uh, the conversation was about whether or not you can feel a rockfish bite on a jig before he actually touches the jig. Oh, I think you can. Yeah, yeah. and we decided that you can, and here's why. Yeah. Because when you really tune into your lure, my dad used to call it thinking down the line. When you really are in tune with what's going on with that lure, you feel everything that happens with it. Mm -hmm. You can tell the difference when it hits the bottom in sand or mud, the yeah. difference between sand and mud, or when it hits a stump or shells, especially. Uh, if I'm fishing around the bridge piling, I know when my jig is on the base of that bridge piling and I know when it falls off. Yep. Uh, because you think down that line and tune into that lure and, and you know everything is happening with it. And a fish, a rockfish, especially a big rockfish, moves water before they hit the lure. Right. There's a big rockfish, there's a whoosh that comes in as they suck that lure in. Mm -hmm. And I've seen, I've seen Jamie Clow throw his rod and reel right down in the bottom of the boat <laughs> after he missed a fish because he felt that whoosh and he knew that that was probably going to be a 40, 45 inch fish mm -hmm. just by the feeling that water move before the, uh, yep. uh, before uh, the fish actually hit the lure. And you can't, uh, you know, you can feel it. it it's, it's one of the biggest mistakes that I think we as fishermen make when it comes to rock fish is that we are not cognizant of their superpowers. They have, they can hear way better than we can. Yeah. They can feel, they have the lateral line, they can feel a lot better than we yeah. can. They have a better sense of smell than we, we do. Uh, and they have almost the same sense of sight as we do. And they actually, they have a better sense of sight because they see better underwater. Uh, and so, you know, we can go out there smoking and joking, stomping beer cans in the bottom of the boat and you might still catch some little fish here and there. But if you want to consistently catch big fish, yeah. Two things you got to do so, is really be quiet. And the other thing is make sure that you're in tune with that jig. It just takes practice. It's not yeah. something you can't learn. How right. long did right. you think it took you? Oh, it was, it was, it, it wasn't like the first time <coughs> it went out. I'm, I'm, you know, it, it, it takes a while to think about, but you know, one of the things that I used to do was I would just go in shallow water and, and watch it a little bit. Now, granted, if you're using a bigger jig, it's not going to be as representative, but especially the lighter stuff, even, you know, even when you're floating and flying, I'm thinking down the line, I'm thinking about what that lure is doing in the water. And I would just sit and watch it a little bit, especially if it's a new plastic, or I would sit and shake it in my hand and kind of stare at it. You know, I enjoyed that kind of stuff, you know, <laughs> the science behind it. I think the more science you can put into it, to the fishing, the better, the more successful you're, you know, you're going to be. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. You know, I, I, I give you an example to just today. I was at the Bay Bridge today and a guy came up on a boat cranking a stereo yeah. and I'm in my kayak. I don't own a boat. I'm a, and so I moved, I just got, I got away because I knew there was, I was already having a tough day. There was no way I was going to, you know, get in and fish with the stereo blasting. Yeah. And, and the mistake that people make is, they do catch fish sometimes. Right. Like if you get into a breaking rockfish, right. it's not it, gonna, it, it don't matter. No. You know, you can do whatever you want to do, yeah. uh, and you're going to catch fish. Uh, it don't matter if you're playing the stereo or you know stomping around in a boat or slamming hatches and stuff like that. Right. But uh, where it really, you know, when it really comes down to it, and you know, I've been lucky enough to win the Kent Narrows Light Tackle Tournaments coming up weekend after next. Uh, I've won it four times out of the last eight years that I've fished it, and every time. One of the components to that win has been stealth. Yep. Uh, and, the, and the other one is tuning in. And that's where I kind of want to focus on just a little bit more is that, yeah. that tuning in thing. So there are tricks to help you tune in. You know, we talk about sensitive rods, mm -hmm. right? Fast rods, extra fast rods, the shorter the better. Six foot rod is more sensitive than a six foot six rod. Yep. The six foot six is more sensitive than a six foot eight rod. Um, but it's hard to find shorter light tackle rods. Yeah. 
um, especially that are fast or extra fast. So I typically will fish with a six foot six or six foot eight uh, fast rod. I like bait casters, uh, but you can do it with a spinning outfit. I grew up with bait casters and I've always fished bait casters and there's some advantages to bait casters and I don't, I don't have enough time to go into all that, but, uh, but you can do it with a spinning outfit just as easily. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, so a sensitive rod helps, but sensitivity, when you think about it, it's not in the rod and it's not in the line or anything like that. It's in your head. Mm -hmm. And the, the most important thing you can do is tune in, is just practice and get out there and do it. Uh, braided line. So braided line is a lot more sensitive than monofilament line. There are some times when you might want to use monofilament. For example, top water, I prefer monofilament over braid. Uh, but uh, braided line has faster frequency, it's, more, it's a lot more sensitive uh, than, uh, than monofilament is. Monofilament has more stretch to it. Uh, so what we typically use is, is, as you guys probably know, is the braided line with a 25 or 30 pound mm -hmm. uh, monofilament or fluorocarbon leader. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and the, the leader, it's not a big long shock leader, you know, like you might use in the ocean or something. It's you know, three feet at the most mm -hmm. and two feet's not too short. Uh, it's just to get add some abrasion resistance because that braid isn't very abrasion resistant. Right, right. Um, and uh, I, what pound test do you like, Tom? Twelve. I've yeah. been fishing twelve for a long time now. That's that seems yeah. the one for me. Ten or twelve. Yep. Fifteen at the highest. Uh, yep. Hey, if you're just starting out, you might want to go with twenty. If you you know it's uh, just harder to feel the bottom with the bigger line. Yeah. Uh, and so it's you know even in the winter I usually fish. Uh, uh, 10 pound pest yeah. braid. Yeah. I like Power Pro. Uh, there's a lot of different braids out there. I, I think I have, if you haven't seen it yet, uh, check out my Chesapeake Minute series mm. uh, on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and search my name, it'll come up. Uh, and, um, and so I did uh, a Chesapeake Minute uh, uh, episode on braided lines mm -hmm. and compared different braided lines, some of the different ones, I talked about the advantages disadvantage of each one I, I like i just got hit to that nano fill by berkeley and i, I gotta say you that, like it i do i it casts i mean you can cast that stuff especially light stuff for for panfish man you can cast that that stuff a country mile on really light tackle but i've got my i actually switched over this is my first season i'm going to try braid on top water because i was looking for more distance on my cast yeah. and Mike, I, I I went went out there uh, a couple of days ago casting top water with this nanofill, and I can see I'm I'm getting 20 yards more on the cast. So yeah, yeah, I'm sure, and and that is the advantage of braid, and there's always trade offs, and so you can definitely right. cast better uh, farther yeah, with braided right. line, and a lot of times I'll use braid for for top water right. too, but I it's generally you know this is about the time once the water temperature gets 65 degrees, mm -hmm. which we're almost there. Yeah. Um, and then that's when I start throwing top water around the points in the rivers. Uh, and so a lot of times people think about top water, they only think about, you know, when breakers and, you know, that's fine. But I, t I usually don't throw top water when I right. see fish breaking, right? Because usually the bigger fish are down deeper. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a, mo a lot more likely to be jigging, uh, when fish are breaking, but where I do throw top water is around the points, around the rip wrap, around underwater structure shallow underwater structure in the rivers yeah uh, and uh, we fish uh, over here on the shore you know I, I like ebay we fish the miles we fish uh, y. the y river the chop tank river is good over on the other side tom you fish the south river yeah uh, quite I've a bit in the you? severn I've, I've i've gotten 30 inch top water on the in the severn river in well, in, in december but it just big big fish at points and piers right off of jonas green just all those piers and those points there, they've all been great, all been great. And so we're not casting. I mean, you might see a fish move every once in a while, but it's blind casting. Mm -hmm. We're yep. looking for what looks like a good fishing spot. Right. You know, and what makes a good top water spot is current. Yeah. More than anything else, you've got to have moving water. Rockfish sleep when it's when the water's not moving, rockfish are sleeping. You might as well just, you know, sit back <laughs> and eat a sandwich <laughs> right. uh, because you're not going to catch anything on slack tide. But once the water starts moving, look for a point where there's a rip. And a rip just means where there's ripples in the water. And usually that designates a spot. That will show you a spot where the water comes up shallow and then it drops off deep. And so as a result of that deep to shallow flow, that creates the rip. Mm -hmm. And rockfish love that kind of structure. Mm -hmm. They can chase bait there. They can hide there. Uh, and that's what makes a good topwater spot. Yeah, yeah. 
Yes. Back to the sensitivity issue. Uh, so we were talking about rockfish, but there are times when sensitivity matters for panfish too, right? Oh, absolutely. Especially with tandem red fish, red fishing. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, and that's, I, you know, I can recall this. I, I went to a meeting that you were holding or hosting and I said, man, I, said, I think I felt a 32nd and a 16th hit the bottom. I'm not, I'm not making it up. I could feel that, just that ever so slight tap at the bottom. And I went, man, that's where I want to be. Yeah. That's where I, and I'm, you know, th again, thinking down that line, thinking about what is that lure doing every single movement that I have. And then as soon as I don't feel that way, you know, you, you feel like you're not yeah, you're in blind. tune. You're, you, it, it, everything's wrong, yeah. and, you know, until you get back in tune again. Yeah, you know? that's exactly right. You know. It's just like getting out of tune on a guitar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, right, right. No good till you get back in tune again. <laughs> right. Now you're playing all the right stuff, just doesn't sound right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can do everything right. right. If you're not tuned in on those lures, yeah. then you're going to have a hard time yeah. uh, catching fish. Because for one thing, you don't feel the fish bite, and the other thing, you don't feel what you're, what's going on with your lure. You don't know if you're on the bottom or how far over the bottom yeah. you are. Yeah, yeah, um, and, uh, and 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 and. I can tell a difference if I'm fishing hard, you know, if I'm fishing every day, right. like, um, and I haven't got to do that too much lately. I can tell a difference than if I fish once a week because mm -hmm. I lose sensitivity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and, um, and, and la uh, I'm honestly, last couple of times I fished with Tommy kicked my butt. <laughs> and, and, uh, part of the reason that won't, that doesn't happen. Often. <laughs> no, uh, part of the reason is he's been able, he gets up, takes his girls to school in the morning, yeah, goes, goes fishing. fishing every day. Yeah. So it's the life of a musician. Yeah, that's correct. A <laughs> pandemic musician right now has a lot of fishing time. So, and I met up with this guy, Matt, that has been, man, we've been hitting it hard, man, hitting new spots and just, we enjoyed the shad season together and what, just talk about another guy that's tuned in. That guy's tuned in yeah. and just nailing, nailing shad the entire time, having a great perch, shad having a great time. Yeah, and that, and that brings up another good subject, and that's a, a good time. This is a good time to talk about this a secret weapon, probably one of the most important, if not the most important, secret weapon uh, for for catching either perch, mm -hmm. panfish, rockfish, redfish, cobia, whatever, and that is the value of a good network. Absolutely. I mean, there's just nothing more important. And I mean, what we're doing right here, this is what we're doing. This is a network, you know, you, you join the clubs, get in with the CCA Virginia. There's a membership drive going on right yep. now. If you're not a member, yep. I highly encourage you to become a member. We're not always going to be doing these damn Zoom meetings, right? You know, we're going to be in person before long. And, and a lot of times what happens at those meetings is you get to talk to people yep. and people will tell you stuff face to face that they won't tell you over the internet. I, I know I will, because right. I'm looking at you, you know, person to person. And there's another human being staring at me there saying, you know, where's a good place for me to take my daughter? Right. And I'm going to probably tell them. Um, and we've drank a beer or two also. Which, <laughs> which, that, that, won't, that sometimes loosens things up a little too much as far as spots go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it might be the might not be the right spot we tell you, but we'll tell you a spot. I admit I've come away from a few readings saying I think I said too much. <laughs> That's not part of the fun. Right. But get a good network and, yeah. and prize that network. Yeah. Take care of it. Uh, nourish it. Yep. Uh, talk to the people uh, that uh, that are within your network. They're the best call that you'll ever make to a fellow fisherman is calling them in on fish. Yep. If you're out there and you're on fish and you pick up the phone and you say, Sean, I am wearing them out two miles north of the Bay Bridge. Yep. Man, I'm going to love you for it. Even if I'm wearing them out, you know, two miles south of the Bay Bridge and I don't want to go yep. up there, yep. I'm still going to love you for calling me in on those fish. Yep. And most of the time, I'm going to go. Uh, and you, who you think I'm going to call next time yeah, I'm right. going to fish? Right. I, oh, I, that reminds me of a story that one of the first, I, I, just a couple years ago, after I'd met Sean, uh, the the was either yellow yellow perch or white perch has started in one of our spots <laughs> and i and i call i i just I, why would he want to know what i'm doing in the middle of the week and i called him and i said hey man the yellow perch are really thick now Re I, it's every cast and and i said 
hey, just, if you don't mind, just keep me in the loop. And he said to me, you are the loop right now. And it <laughs> made me realize that you have important, you know, you have important information to give. Maybe it might not even be a good report, but it's still letting letting your network know what you saw. Don't feel like you have to embellish it. If you went out and you didn't catch anything. I remember him saying that to me also about going, hey, if you don't catch anything, that's okay too. Just tell me what, what you saw. What did you observe? Because that can help the next fisherman that goes out. All that information. I mean, sure, calling somebody in on fish is great. We, we all know that. But but also, you know, if you if you also go out and you don't have a great day or you just catch a couple, just be honest to the network. And then the network will be honest back towards you with the information that they give. And I always thought that was a really important aspect too of just, just being honest reports and letting everyone know any little detail that you could remember because yeah. someone else might have something that they can add to that that might might help them in that when they go out and then in turn i'm sure they're going to come back to you and say here's what i did you know so yeah yeah it, it that's uh it, it you can't underestimate the value of, mm -hmm. a, of a good network it's just uh, uh it's so important to do that and so you know like i say you're doing it right get in the clubs yep. get out there and go to the meetings uh, fishing shows are great when we're having fishing shows, you know, hopefully we'll start those will pick back up this uh, this winter. Uh, and uh, we got a whole summer coming up, you know, in the fall that uh, things are going to start happening and we're going to have events and stuff and you can get out there and go. Uh, so, so that should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, but uh, so I, I don't know if uh, I, mean, I, I want to tell you a little bit about what's going on with rockfish right now. Um, so in case you go in the next week or so, so, uh, most of the fish have, uh, have spawned now. They're still, you know, my brother's a fisheries biologist and he always tells me, don't think of the spawn as an event. Um, I mean, as a, as a, yeah, as an event, think of it as a time frame. uh, and rockfish can spawn anywhere between February and July. In fact, one of the biggest uh, rockfish I ever caught above the Bay Bridge came mm -hmm. off the sewer pipe on the 4th of July mm -hmm. um, on top water, of all things. Um, and uh, that, if you don't know where the sewer pipe is, that's just north of the Bay Bridge. There's a pipe that runs out from Kent Island. It's actually this Kent Island sewage treat treatment plant discharge. And it's, a, uh, I don't know, probably a 16-inch pipe, 16-inch yeah. diameter pipe with rocks on both sides of it. And if you cross the Bay Bridge and look north, uh, on the Kent Island side, you will see the rip that that pipe causes when yep. the current's running. Um, and uh, it's a great place to fish. Uh, there's been a few fish there. There's been a few fish at the Bay Bridge. Uh, the mouths of the rivers are where it's at right now, though. And this time of year, if you want to catch big fish, bigger fish, now when I'm talking, it's all relative. You know, our 40 inch fish have pretty much moved on. We may get a few here and there. Uh, but uh, but you still might catch some 35 inch fish, you know, or 37 inch fish. Mm -hmm. um, and we did, you know, uh, the Kent Narrows tournament three, two years ago. No, yeah, it was two years ago. Uh, uh, Nick Lombardi caught a 42 inch striper on my boat mm -hmm. right off Bloody Point. Um, and uh, and so that's another, you know, uh, an option you can might be able to catch those. But what we're concentrating on is unsuccessful spawners. And if you saw our podcast last night, we, I did a podcast with Sikorsky here in the shop. Um, and I talked about that a little bit and I'll just touch on it here. So uh, unsuccessful spawners, these are, these are fish that are just reaching maturity. They're not quite old enough to run with the coastal stock yet. Uh, and so they're kind of like teenagers you know, they're standing around looking at each other. They don't know what to do. They don't quite make it up to the spawning grounds. Right. And if uh, if you catch and clean one, they'll have green eggs in them, uh, and where they're just not hardly mature enough. You know, for those eggs to uh, to to ha to get big enough to uh, for them to uh, for them to spawn. Um, and so you can make that work for you when you find out the places where those fish hang out. And it's usually the mouths of the river, especially structure around the mouths of the rivers. And I can think of several places, uh, Eastern Bay, the mouth of the Shop Tank, uh, the mouth of the Chester River, and the Upper Bay, the mouth of the uh, um, uh, uh, Patapsco River, uh, outside of Baltimore. All those places are good places to look for those unsuccessful spawners. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, when we're fishing that Kent Narrows tournament coming up in two weeks, that's what we're concentrating on is those unsuccessful spawners. That's what we're looking for because we know that's going to be the bigger fish. Mm -hmm. Not always. Sometimes we have fish running in schools, chasing them in Hayden by that time, but not quite. 
so that's what we're concentrating on right now. I'm gonna, I'm taking some time off next week just for rockfish, uh, and uh, be fishing this weekend. And that's the, those are the kind of places. Every place that I just mentioned right there, mm -hmm. those are the places that uh, that sure. we're gonna fish. Yeah. But you did you went rock fishing what yesterday? You went did. south, didn't you? I Maybe. did. I went down to the to the, to power, the power plant. plant. Yep. Yeah. Yep, I got a, I got a couple down there. It wasn't a wasn't a banner day, but I I did have the rod bent over a few times, so that was a mm -hmm. that was nice. That's always a great a great place to fish too. And I I fished that one. I don't know if any of you are kayak fishermen, but I I fish the rips in my kayak. I I launch right out of Flag Ponds Park, and I put my kayak right in that rip. In you know if you're a if if any of you are kayak fishermen, if you're a beginning kayak fisherman, just be careful. You know. I fish it in the winter. I've got the proper gear to protect myself. Uh, and I've caught big fish in the winter time at those rips. I've caught citation speckled trout there at up to 24 inches at, at the rips in my kayak. And there is, that's an awesome feeling. I mean, it's just, it's a different experience in a kayak and it's, it's a lot of fun to fish that, that particular area. Um, in the kayak and, and it's a great it's tons of current there just bring a lot of two inch uh, excuse me two ounce sinkers because you if you're not losing any 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 jig heads there you're not getting down on the bottom <laughs> a two a two ounce uh jig head will get you down on the bottom and, and just pop that thing off of the bottom feel those rocks and pop it right off of there and you'll probably be successful yeah absolutely and so we want to wrap up about 8 15 or so but uh uh, if, if anyone has, we want to offer opportunity for questions and you don't have to unmute. I've got the chat box open now. Uh, so if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a chat section down there. Uh, and then you can just type that and it'll open the chat um, section over on the right side of your screen. And you can type a question in if you have a question or anything. Uh, and uh, we'll do our best to answer it here um, before we uh, before we wrap up. Uh, but while, while we're doing that, I also wanted to mention that uh, um, to thank Rob, uh, Alan, and um, and um, all the guys um, in, um, in in the Northern Virginia chapter for all the great work that you guys are yeah. doing. Not uh, not just with your me, <laughs> not just with your meeting. Somebody being a smart aleck and it's Dave Antos, <laughs> <laughs> which what a surprise. <laughs> Dave was over here at the shop not long ago. He was, <laughs> he was sitting in that chair too. This so. is my chair. <laughs> my chair. But uh, but uh, we uh, uh, we really appreciate the work that you guys are doing, Rob and and and, yeah. and, and Dave and Ernie. Everybody in this chapter is uh, is fantastic, and we appreciate the fact that you guys have shared. Uh, some of uh, the opportunities that you have shared with us and, yeah. uh, and some of the hard work that uh, that you guys are doing. So, so that's fantastic. So I don't, I don't see any questions other than Dave Vantos wants to know if uh, what Dr. Fauci's funding, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> he's talking about polysomnography technology. Now, now that's what I, I work at George Washington University. I'm a director of their sleep program there. And uh, that's what polysomnography is. So, <laughs> um, so hey, John, I, I did have a question for you. What, what's your thought on this yearly migration of, of uh, these uh, dolphins that are pushing the up the bay every year are they are they chasing the rockfish or are they because i swear i saw one a group circling small rockfish last year on the upper bay and chowing down on them i i did, can't prove it but it sure looked that way no they are they do uh and the quickest way to shut down a bite is when a yeah. dolphin shows up i've Dave, i've had them actually take rockfish off my lures before um, I had a bull shark do that one time too, but, uh, but I've had dolphins grab a rockfish after I've caught them before. Uh, so, so they will do that. They're here to eat menhaden. Uh, that's what they're here for, but they're opportunistic, you know, feeders. And so they will, they will hit a rock. There, I don't know why there are more dolphins in the bay now than there have been. They've always been here. I remember the first year I was here, I was down in, around Taylor's Island and I saw a big pot of dolphins down there. But it seems like we see more and more every year, and especially more farther north mm -hmm. uh, and in the rivers. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I think it has a lot to do with it. There are just not enough bait down in Virginia anymore, thanks to our friends in the, <laughs> in the Menhaden harvest industry. Uh, and so they have to come to Maryland where they don't allow those boats. 
Uh, and so they keep pushing up farther and farther. And it may have to do with the fact that the bay is warmer now than it was. That, I'm sure that has something to do with it. But absolutely, you're right. They will shut a rockfish bite down. And there's some people that believe, and I'm not sure that they're wrong, that they're pushing the rockfish farther north every summer. Uh, as you know, they, we usually have a big concentration yeah. Yeah. of fish yeah. up around the Hodges Bar and have for the last three years. Yep. Uh, and some people think they go up there to get away from the dolphins, but you know, I've seen dolphins up there too. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't know. Um, so, um, let's see, Stuart says, yeah. I had an interesting conversation with a charter captain yesterday. He claimed that, uh, on a color fish finder, he could tell by the reflection color, whether the fish had fed a, had fed a green reflection indicated a fed fish and a red reflection indicated a fish had had me <laughs> well i mean that guy could probably teach me something <laughs> that's right yeah yeah you, you another question about about colors i will let you answer but I, I think all i would say is just contrasting colors right any particular colors for bigger fish jig heads plastics well let me show you some so here's something i've been experimenting with this year i don't know if you can see this or not so uh I'm not, I'm not going to give away the secret to, to how to swirl paint uh, jig heads because sure as I do, somebody's going to be selling them. Uh, but, uh, but if you ever get into making your own jig heads, I, hit me up and I'll tell you uh, back channel. But, uh, but I like contrasting colors and there's a lot of different reasons for that. I think con color contrast stimulates a predatory instinct in fish. Um, if you've ever... If you've ever watched, you know, I like that Planet Earth series yeah, on yeah. Um, I know exactly. like Discovery Channel or yeah, something. Yeah. And that thing is fantastic. I especially like the ocean uh, versions, episodes. Yep. episodes. And you, 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 you see one of the gannets, all the yeah, gannets yeah, diving, yeah. and then the, all the bait fish are, are they're all uh, schooled up and they're moving around and the predators are darting mm -hmm. through them. Yep. And every time those fish move, they move yeah. all at once and there's a flash. And it, there's a color contrast. Maybe it's gill, uh, the flash of a gill plate. Yeah. Maybe it's the sun off the scales. Whatever it is, there's contrast there. It's just like if you wake up in the middle of the night, you know, and you got to go to the bathroom, you're not looking for color. You're looking for con you're looking for the crack in the door where there's a little <laughs> bit of light. Right. Or you're looking for the edge of the bedpost so you don't stub your toe. Uh, so it's the same way with fish, you know, you're looking for that, they're looking for color contrast first and, and then color second. Uh, so contrast, I think, makes a big difference and that's why I like uh, color contrast. You probably heard me talk about candy corn jig heads um, and some people are making them, especially my buddy Coach, uh, um, who is, it's just a combination of colors that rockfish see best, white, chartreuse, and orange. Uh, and uh, you know those are the colors that, that we, they see best because they see very similar to what we mm -hmm. see. Mm -hmm. If you, you know, if you drove home from work today and you went through a construction zone, you probably saw some barrels out there. And what color are the barrels? Yeah. They're orange. And if the workers are out there, they're wearing vests. And what color are the vests? They're chartreuse, yeah. right? Well, that's the colors we see best and rockfish see very similar to how we do. Um, so, uh, and if anybody's interested, I am selling these, these, just <laughs> email me. I'm selling them right now. I'm the guy that's selling them. <laughs> See, I told you it wouldn't take so long. It doesn't take long. <laughs> just email me and I'll sell you one. <laughs> Matt Gins wants to know why does the perch run only last three days? <laughs> <laughs> Tell them that story. Okay, so, uh, well, Matt. <laughs> Since you asked, since you asked, I was uh, fish, I, can I say that mm -hmm. I was fishing at Red Bridges over mm -hmm. in Greensboro uh, a couple years ago, and um, and I had been fishing it for a few days in a row and was having great success, float and fly, tandem rig, both of those. And this particular morning was a tough morning. I think maybe it, the temperature had dropped early in the morning or something. Just had shut the bite down. This guy comes up to me and goes, three days, perch run only lasts three days." And I just looked at him and I said, tell everyone you know that. <laughs> tell all your friends, tell people you don't know, tell everyone that the perch run lasts for three days. I caught my first pre-spawn white perch in Denton this year, May, uh, March 10th. Yeah. I emailed him or, or texted him May 10th with an 11 inch pre-spawn white perch and i just held it up and i went three days it's three days so 
Man. For, and you caught keepers last week. Right? Yeah, yeah, I caught pre-spawn. keepers. Yeah, pre-spawn. I caught <laughs> pre-spawn keepers last week. So again, like sort of reemphasizing what you were saying that that spawn is not a single thing. It's a big event that happens over a period of time, as opposed to here it is. We all spawn at once. It, it sort of comes in waves. Yeah, you know, that's exactly right. Yeah. You know, and same with shad. Yeah, yeah. Same with shad. yeah. they they yeah. don't all spawn at one time. Yeah, you get a wave and you get another wave and get another wave and. <laughs> Three days. Yeah. <laughs> Three days. Uh, one more question is uh, going into summer, where are fishing opportunities in Maryland waters? Well, I mentioned about the upper bay and some of those spots in the mouths of the rivers, which is where I'd be fishing right now. I mean, not I wouldn't be fishing the upper bay. I'd be fishing the mouths of the rivers, maybe the upper bay uh, right now uh, more than anywhere else. But as summer keeps coming on, the water gets warmer. The fish are going to uh, start chasing bait more in the open bay. Um, so, uh, you know, I like, I especially like uh, in mid-June over toward the Deal area mm -hmm. and from there down to Chesapeake Beach and maybe all the way down even to Parker's Creek mm -hmm. uh, can be really good. Yep. And then uh, it, later in the summer, especially once the Spanish mackerel arrive and the bluefish are here in force, uh, Sharps <laughs> Island and south of Sharps Island can be really well, really good. That's where I stay. Once, uh, once July, the, my last two years, once July, month of July, I don't, I don't really target rockfish much. I, I enjoy catching Spanish mackerel and bluefish and redfish. I stay south of Sharps with a friend of mine constantly. Yeah. I love it down there. Yeah, and you know now that we've got these bull redfish in the bay, yeah. you know, if you haven't got in on that, uh, it's awesome. Guide, it's uh, awesome. You know, my, my regular fishing partner that I fished with for 15 years, Jamie Clow, is now guiding. Uh, if you can get out with Jamie, he'll put you on redfish. Yep. Uh, and there's a lot of other good guys out there, too. Uh, and he'll show you how to do it. And you don't have to go once, and then you know how. So, uh, you know, give give it a shot. I mean, who doesn't want to catch a 50-inch redfish? Yep. It's just a, it's the most fun you can have. We have a kayak on. question. Let me yeah. see. So, at the power plant, be sure you're able to back in your car. Yes, I am actually tethered to my kayak at the ribs. Yeah, the question was, I mean, yeah. they, the state, it's actually a statement yeah. from Wes who says, make sure you're able to back up in your kayak in case of, oh, to get back in your kayak. Yeah, I think it's to get back in. Get yeah. back in your yeah, kayak. Yeah, I, 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 I've got a dry suit on for winter months because I'm out there when that water is 40, 40 some degrees and, uh, and I tether myself to my kayak so that if I do get separated or if I'm in the water, fortunately enough, I've never had that experience and I hope never to, but if it were to happen, I have taken every precaution to, to get myself back into the kayak. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't do a whole lot of kayak fishing anymore, but back when I did, I used to do reboarding drills. Mm -hmm. You know, I get in shallow water yeah. and, and, you know, try not to touch the bottom, just yeah. see if I can get yeah. myself yeah. back in that yep. kayak. Yep. And, uh, you know, I don't know if I'm in shape after this back surgery to do it anymore, but I, I'm coming back. <laughs> and I will say that too, you know, as it relates to that, to that, as far as a kayak fisherman goes, if you are fishing cold water and you're in a dry suit and you have never done it, put yourself in your dry suit and go get in that really cold water. It's not fun, but you want to know what it's going to feel like. You do not want the first time you're falling into 44 degree water to be the time that you flip your kayak over. Just go get in the water in your dry suit because it, it's worth it. It's not a fun experience, but yeah. it's worth it to know what you're going to get into. Yeah. And uh, let's see, um, Wayne Young says, how's your new book coming along? And I appreciate that, Wayne, uh, <laughs> from a fellow author. Uh, if you haven't read any of Wayne's books, I highly encourage you to. I knew about Wayne's books before he published his first one. And uh, if you want to know about the, the artificial reef initiatives in Maryland, where they are, why they're there, and what it's all about, even how to fish them, get Wayne's books. They're fantastic. And so, Wayne, you know, I keep talking about it. Um, and uh, I'm working on an updated edition of Chesapeake Light Tackle that will be <laughs> this year. Uh, and I hope to have it out by September. I'm going to uh, release it in hardcover first, and then I hope to have paperbacks out by Christmas. And this is going to include a redfish chapter and a cobia chapter, uh, mm -hmm. some more uh, some more updated information. Not that the book's not great right now. I mean, I plug my uh, if I can't plug my book, who can? But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Yeah. But, uh, 
but everything is pertinent that's in the book. I just thought it might be yeah. nice since we have these other species yeah. now that we yeah. can yeah. fish for to uh, to include some information on them and you know update the pictures and, and yeah. stuff like that. So that's my uh, my project this year. I'm going to do a box set of all three books that are all three hardcover too. Uh, as a gift set and mm -hmm. have that ready by the holidays too. So that's what I'm working on. And then the next uh, next book project is probably just going to be a fishing stories book. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell, you know, I'm just going to sit here. And yeah, that's fun. No, tell, tell, that's tell fun. Tales. fun. Yeah. I, there's a question, what kind of kayak? Do I, I have a Hobie uh, Revolution 13. I like the, I, you know, I think the, uh, the Outback is sort of the preferred model among the kayak <clears throat> fishermen. It's too heavy for me. So I, I prefer the revolution I've, it's plenty stable and i'm i am much more aerodynamic i will say that for fishing the rips that revolution is a lot better than the wider body of the of the outback it, it allows me to cut through that that rip a little bit easier yeah 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 and, and it's good that you share that information you know there's a lot of misinformation out there it seems like everybody's got something to sell mm -hmm. on fishing groups you know mm -hmm. I, I see these fishing posts and stuff and they'll have 50 ha hashtags right, yeah, right. You know? and right. I'm like, what do you think you're going to get out of that right. and all those people going to send you free equipment <laughs> right, right. You know, get you anything yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> to do that yeah but uh but you know talk to the guys who actually fish every day what yeah. are they doing that's you right know? you that's don't right. have to spend a whole lot of money to get out there on the water do you no no you don't no <laughs> nope no okay all right so we're gonna wrap it up um so so rob thank you again uh for having us out and uh, we really enjoyed it thank you for letting us pick and, and grin a little yeah, bit. yeah. <laughs> and, and we appreciate it one thing for sure you guys always seem to have a good time yeah, we do <laughs> and I, li I like